Hi, everyone. So right now, there are over 2.5 million IT jobs on LinkedIn worldwide. 2.5 million. It's crazy. So putting that into perspective, hundreds and thousands of your competitors are looking and competing for the same talent. Just in Australia alone, there's over 20,000 IT jobs right now on LinkedIn as well. So as an employer, there's a huge amount of competition and that's why it's really important to make sure that you are creating a best place to work because it's so competitive. So we all know there's this war for talent and being a best place to work helps you attract and also retain your talent. And as an employee, what's in it for you? Well, as an employee, working for a best place to work culture lets you enjoy all of the hours, the many, many hours that we spend at work every day. So it's a win-win. The purpose of my talk today is to both inspire you, hopefully, and also give you some practical tips of how to create a best place to work culture and potentially even win a best place to work award. So most of you have probably heard of work-life balance. When I think of best place to work cultures, work-life balance is spruiked by every company. You know, we've got great work-life balance, we've got work-life balance. I don't actually believe in work-life balance. I think that we've got one life and that we should be calling it work-life integration. And for me, this is because I believe that life is short and we need to make the most of every day that we've got. And I know this firsthand because when I was 17, I had a, a near-death experience which kind of shaped the way that I lived my life. I was at a shopping centre on my lunch break and I looked at my watch and I was like, crap, I'm running late. And for any of you that know me, some of you know me in the room, uh, that hasn't changed. I'm still always running late. So I raced as quickly as I could towards the traffic lights. And my work was just over the highway. It was a six-lane highway. And I looked at the little red man. And I was like, oh, I don't have time to wait for the green man. Who's got time to wait for the green man? So I looked left, I looked right, and I ran. The next thing I remember is the sound, this really terrifyingly loud sound of cars and this zoom, zoom, just the loudest, most incredible noise that I can remember. And I didn't have any, any vision, it was all black, but I could hear this noise. And I remember being really afraid and trying to curl my legs up because apparently I was laying on the ground at that point and I couldn't move. The next thing I remember was the sound of my friend's voice, my colleague Leanne. And she said to me, you're going to be OK, Donna. You're in an ambulance, but you're going to be OK. The next thing I remember was the sound of someone's voice saying, we can't move her. We're going to need to cut off her clothes. And I must have been starting to come round a little by this point, because all I could think was, oh my god, please don't cut off my clothes. I was wearing my work uniform, and it cost me about $120. And as a 17-year-old, that was like a whole week's salary, which was pretty huge. They did. When I woke up and came round about six hours later, I was in a hospital and my family were there and the doctor was showing me the x-rays and was telling me that I was very lucky and I had no injuries and everything was fine and I could go home. What I later found out had happened is that I'd ran across the road directly in front of a car going about 60 kilometres an hour, I had rolled onto the bonnet of that car and smashed the windscreen of the car with my head. I did have a sore head for a little while after that, and then landed on the ground, and I was unconscious for about six hours. And I'm really grateful that I had that experience at such a young age, because what that made me realise is that, holy crap, like, my, my life could have been over, and I would have had no warning. I would have had no idea. I didn't see the car coming. I didn't feel anything. It just would have been gone. So ever since that time, I've really been very careful and thoughtful about how I spend every day and how I spend my life and making sure that I do tick the things off my bucket list that I want to achieve and that I do you know, follow my passions and do what I enjoy because life is short and we just don't know when our last day could be. And we all have that power to choose how we spend our life. We choose what we do every day, how we do it. We choose what goals we set. We choose how we make a difference in the world. 
And if your job feels like work and you don't enjoy it, then stop doing it and find another job. I'm not saying go out tomorrow and quit your jobs, maybe look for another job first. But, you know, my point is life is too short to be spending every day doing something that you don't enjoy. And not all of us know what we want to do, right? Not all of us know what our passion is. Say there's probably a fair chance in this room and at this conference, a lot of people have a pretty good idea, but, but not everyone knows exactly what that looks like. So one of the things that I think helps is to think about if today was your last day, or say tomorrow, because today is like nearly halfway gone. If tomorrow's your last day, how would you spend that day? And then think about, okay, what if you had a month? If you had one month, what would that month look like? What would you do with that month? And then take it to that next level and go, okay, I've got a year. What would I do in a year? And I think if you stop and reflect on that, it, it helps to kind of figure out, well, what are my passions? What's important in my life? The other thing that I found really, really helpful was Simon Sinek's book. A big fan of Simon Sinek and his book, How to Find Your Why, is absolutely fantastic because it gives you practical step-by-step -step tips to work out what are the stories that have shaped your life, what are the things that have engaged your passions and what are the things that you enjoy doing and then how to frame them into what your purpose is and what your why is. So if you haven't read that book, I would highly recommend it. And then the other one is we've all thought about what would I do if I won a lotto, right? And sure, most people are like, I'll take six, 12 months off, I'll go travel the world. But then what? When life settles down and gets back to normal, what would you do if you didn't have to get paid to do something? And then how do we turn that into something that we get paid for and can do as a job? Because it's all possible. One of the most insightful books that I've recently read is The Subtle Art of Not Giving a F-U-C-K. It's being recorded, so I don't think I can say the word. But it, the book is absolutely amazing because it talks about how our brains love to solve problems. And if we solve all of the problems in our life or in our work, our brain will just create more problems. That's what it does. So find the problems that you really enjoy solving and then make sure that your work and your life has those types of problems because all of a sudden it becomes fun. That was a big segue into building a best place to work culture, I realise. But there were two main points that I really wanted to get across. One is that it's no one else's job or responsibility to make you happy at work. Only you have that power. And if anyone has heard of locus of control, or if you haven't heard of it, Google it and have a read of internal locus of control versus external locus of control. It's life-changing. The second point is that all of us as employees have the power to help make the place we work a best place to work. If you get involved and help rather than waiting for a manager or HR to do things, it will happen much quicker. So be that change that you want to see. I recently had a consultant come up to me at Redify in Perth and flag some problems with the grad program. And he asked if he could have some dedicated time to help with it. And I was like, absolutely, sure. So if you go to a, a leader with you know, a problem and a suggestion for a solution and you ask to own it and drive it, most people will say yes. But if you don't ask, you don't get. So the award itself. There's quite a few different culture awards and best place to work awards that you can look into. One of the biggest ones was known as the BRW Best Place to Work Award, and that was because the BRW magazine had sole rights to publish when the awards were announced. And it's created by a company called Great Place to Work. And one of the main reasons for getting an award like this under your belt is an attraction of staff method. Um, unless you're a Facebook or a Google or a Microsoft, most people haven't heard of you. So in tech, with this war for talent that we've got, a lot of the times we're trying to recruit interstate, overseas, and people don't know who you are. So LinkedIn is one of the ways that a lot of recruiters and a lot of people use to reach out to candidates. So most of you have probably heard of in-mails, and they're the message that, messages that you send through LinkedIn. The average in-mail acceptance rate is about 16%. After we won our Best Place to Work award in my previous company, we framed our message and we would put on a message, you know, we're the number eight best place to work in Australia, yada, yada, yada. And our in-mail acceptance rate went up by over 25%. So we were already above the average 16, but then we got another 25%.
So that's a huge competitive advantage to getting someone to, to say, yes, I'll have a chat with you, which is all you're trying to do at that point. So how do you actually win one? There's two main components to the Best Place to Work Award. One is an employee satisfaction survey that they will send out to your staff and it's anonymous. And obviously that's the standard kind of questions around the culture and what it's like. So you do have to have a, a pretty decent place to work to be able to get through that one stage of it, right? Because you can't control what people are saying. So it's got to be genuine. But the second part is a best practices document. So they ask you a whole heap of questions and you need to, um, they're not interested in just what your process is and what your policy is. The biggest tip is that they're looking for real stories and real feedback and real examples of how you actually live and breathe the culture of your organisation. So things like how you drive communication, how you thank your employees, how you make them feel welcome, how you're transparent, how you enable career progression, these are all specific questions that they'll ask you and it's not just about saying we do this, we do that, it's about saying well here's a story about blah, you know, blah, progressed their career because they did this, they did this, they did this. Put a testimonial, put a real life picture and, and make it real. That's what they're looking for. The rest of this talk is going to be focused more on actually creating a best place to work. But if anybody wants, if anyone has more questions around the awards in itself, please feel free to come and grab me later on. I'll be here for the whole conference. So in my experience, these are the core areas that really make up a great place to work culture that is worth focusing on. And the best place to work is all about culture. But what is culture? For me, culture is values, beliefs and behaviours that are shared and demonstrated across the organisation. And there's some common themes in tech, certainly from all the big, big companies, around ownership, collaboration, learning, innovation. They're some of the key ones. But the main thing is you want to involve your teams and come up with your values and beliefs collaboratively because one person doesn't create the culture. Every single team member does. So ensuring that the majority of people are on board and buy into your values is essential. Otherwise, they won't be shared values. At Redify, Rob Moore and a few other people were involved in driving an initiative to create the core beliefs that you see here behind you. So this was only about a year ago. So my point is you don't have to be a brand new organisation just starting to be able to revamp your values and your beliefs or to create them. You can do this at any point. And this was done collaboratively across Yammer, across the whole organisation nationally. So everybody could contribute and be part of creating and choosing what these core values were and core beliefs were. When I first joined my previous company, Ignia, we were only 25 people. So it was... It was a bit easier because they hadn't created shared values before. So the first thing that I did was went around and spoke to all of the, the employees and asked them, what do you want your culture to look like? What do you want our values to be? And collaboratively, as a company, we all came up with some core values together. And this was absolutely one of the reasons that we doubled in size over 12 months and we won our BRW Best Place to Work Award the following year. So it's a really good grounding. The other major component of creating the shared values is rewarding the behaviour that you want to encourage. And this is really important. I was at an event a few weeks ago and there was quite a high-profile high um, woman leading the event and she was talking about telling stories and using stories instead of you know, just telling people what to do. So she was talking specifically around in your interview process. And she said, in your interview process, rather than saying, you know, this is the behaviour that we want to see or this is what a culture is, tell a story about an employee in your organisation who's demonstrating those behaviours and who's demonstrating that culture. And I was like, yeah, like, that's a really, really good idea. Love that. So wholeheartedly agree with that. And then she gave an example and she talked about, she talked about a team that was working on a project and she talked about a graduate. The project was due on the Monday and the graduate came in and spent the whole weekend working on this project to take it to that next level and really polish it and make sure it was amazing. And then on the Monday it was delivered and the customer was super, super happy and everything was great. And she was celebrating this graduate for stepping up, coming in on the weekend, making sure, taking pride in the work and making sure that the project was fantastic. And my initial reaction was like, yeah, that's cool, that's a good story. And then I started thinking about it and I was like, hang on a second, 
Like, do I want my employees coming in and working on the weekends? Not so much. You know, do I want them needing to do that because either they haven't planned out the project work or they weren't given enough capacity to do the work that they needed to do, that they had to come and work overtime? No, that's not good either. And then I was also like, well, and also do you want that hero complex of one person from the team came in and saved the day rather than the team collaboratively did this together? I was like, no, that's also not what I would want to drive. So you've got to be really careful because sometimes stories can sound like a good story, but actually it's not the culture and the behaviours that you're wanting to demonstrate in your organisation. Everyone knows that you don't leave companies, you leave managers, right? So how about we get rid of managers and employ leaders instead? <laughs> um, and I want to make it clear that anyone can be a leader. You don't have to be in a senior position or have a manager title to be a leader. I've been upwards managing and leading for much, much longer than I've had a manager title for. It can definitely help, but it's not necessary. People will follow great leaders as well, so the title will come if you act and behave like a leader. So if you do want to be your best place to work, you need to have good leaders. So if they've got gaps, then provide them with training. There's so many great training out there for leaders. We recently had a session with a lady called Georgia Merch on communication for leaders. And one of the best tips that she gave was nip things in the bud. If you jump on things quickly before it becomes a big is issue, it won't escalate. Another company that I work with closely is Illuminate Group. And they provide a whole heap of leadership and innovation training. And they also run some through the Department of Training, so it's subsidised as well. So not only is it awesome, but it's cost effective. It's a win-win. Um, but there's so many, there's heaps and heaps of great training. So if you need any recommendations, then once again, feel free to come and chat to me later. So as a leadership team, the following five areas are the main things that I think need to be focused on. The first one is autonomy, mastery and purpose. And many of you would have read, read Dan Pink's book, Drive. But as leaders, we need to set the vision. Where are we going and why? And then provide empowerment and ownership for the team to help run that. Task-driven environments are over. Firstly, task-driven jobs are the first ones getting automated. And secondly, younger generations aren't interested in task-driven work anymore. There's much less fulfillment. So it needs to be more. Providing ownership is also a win-win around flexibility because it takes away the conversation about flexibility because it's about results, it's not about hours and that's something that all jobs of the future are going to need. There's heaps of stats showing that people's primary reason for coming to work isn't money. So leaders need to give people more than that. They need to inspire and set a vision. The second area is transparency and clear expectations. What equals success and how are decisions made? One of the things that I've been really impressed with about coming to Redify is the level of transparency across the organisation. You know, we have the intranet contains everything and anything you could possibly want to know. All of us have the power to edit the intranet as well, which is unheard of from my experience. Power BI has all of the information around our revenue, our rates, you know, projects, how they're tracking. All of us has that, have access to all of that information, which, once again, I've never seen before. Decisions are made predominantly, about 95% of them, on Yammer collaboratively. So everyone can get involved and everybody knows what decisions are, are happening. And that's the way that you really you know, help people buy into your culture. The third area is empathy and emotional intelligence. I personally don't believe you can be a leader if you don't have these. They're huge. Um, I've seen lots of technical people promoted in the past because they're the subject matter expert and there's nowhere else for them to go. Um, but they either hate the role because it's not their passion or they're terrible at it because they don't get people and they're not interested in getting people. So making sure that people are in the right roles and they're doing what they enjoy doing is really important. The fourth point is that good leaders look to replace themselves. It, you know, 20 years ago was a different culture where you had a very linear pathway and you had to hold on to your knowledge because, you know, you needed to keep your job and there was only one job that you could go to. But it's totally different now. If we can mentor and share your responsibilities, everyone wins because other people progress and you create new opportunities for yourself. I've just replaced myself in Perth. I moved to Melbourne a week ago 
honest to comment. And you know what? I don't know what's going to happen after Master Comment finishes. But I'm not worried about it because if you grow other people around you, more opportunities will be created. So it's a very different culture. And leaders need to understand that and get that and not be afraid. Otherwise, they can't be a good leader. The final point is leading by example and practicing what you preach. These are huge um, key areas that leaders need to have. I ran a Women in Technology WA event a few months ago and it was on role models. And I had I handpicked some of my the leaders that have inspired me throughout my career and they shared their stories of leaders who inspired them and what they thought was important as a leader. And one of the things that came out was that the quickest way to build trust and respect is to really get hands on with your team and be prepared to do anything that they have to do and then doing what you say you'll do. It might sound really simple, but I've worked with so many managers that just don't follow through and do what you say you'll do. And it's the same as the customer ethos, um, you know, under promise, over -deli deliver. It's the same as a leader. And you'll be amazed at the respect you can earn by stacking the dishwasher or going and getting your team coffee. It's little things like that and being authentic and genuine about it. One of my favourite Georgia Merch sayings is that people hear your content, but they smell your intent. And these are a couple of really great communication books that she's written, and I'm not getting a kickback for this, I promise, but she's just incredible. So for me, what this means is that if you're genuine about whatever message you're saying to someone, it's much more likely, if you're trying to achieve a win-win, it's much more likely they're gonna feel that you're genuine about it and wanna come on that journey with you and wanna, wanna work with you and help you. So people hear your content, but they smell your intent. And I might be a little biased here, but people are the most important part of our business. Um, we're a long way away from having, and I might be wrong here, I'm sort of scared them in a room of really smart developers, but we, we are quite a way away from, have, from AI having the AI and empathy to replace people completely, I hope. Um, and hiring is one of the biggest challenges for most organisations. Without training, people automatically hire people the same as them. It's, it's just what all of us do, and we call this unconscious bias. And we hire for culture fit, right? But what is culture fit? Hiring for culture fit can often just be an excuse to hire people that we like or hire people that are the same as us. <coughs> so we need to create interview questions and criteria based on our values and our shared beliefs. And that's really important to helping stop some of the unconscious bias around. I'm gonna delve really deeply into um, recruitment and interview processes and all of those things in my talk tomorrow. So if anyone's interested in that, then feel free to come along. Great people want to work with great people. It creates momentum. In the last three organisations that I've worked with, by creating a best place to work culture and hiring great people, we increased our internal referral rate to over 50% of all hiring. And I, it got up to as high as 75% at some points. So if you can do that, that's a huge competitive advantage for your business once again on getting fantastic people. Because your people are your best promoters. So yes, create a referral program, but also promote and help your people with their personal branding. I've worked with companies that have been really afraid of that because you know, if they get a great personal brand, they'll get all these job offers and they'll go and get another job. You know what, they're gonna get all these job offers anyway. So it benefits you to help them because it benefits your organization as well. So you know, provide training for them, pay for them, give them time to speak at conferences like this, um, you know, give them time to write white papers or blogs and just help them in general. Find out where the people that you want are. Get involved as an organisation through support and sponsorship and community engagement. You know, Redify is sponsoring NDC today. It's because we know where our people are, right? And we want to reach those people and we want those people to get to see you know, what we do and, and what we're about. And then build your employee brand. And employee brand is another thing I'm covering in depth in tomorrow's talk. But spruik your people on LinkedIn and on your website. Use real photos, real videos, real, um, real stories and employee testimonials and use them on LinkedIn and on your careers page as well. And I may have forgotten to set a timer, so if someone can like, let me know when I'm 10 minutes like, before the end, that'd be amazing. Um, you know, diversity is a hot topic right now. 
Personally, I can't wait until it's not a separate slide that we have to talk about and it's just the way that we work and it's just how it is, but we're not quite there yet. There are so many statistics from all across the globe on company performance with versus without diversity. Um, a recent McKinsey study that I read showed that companies were 15% more likely to be above the financial medium returns with gender diversity and a whopping 35% above average financial returns with racial and ethnic diversity. So it's massive. And it's not just that, the companies without diversity were often in the bottom quartile for company performance. So educate your teams on the benefits of diversity, why it's important, and provide unconscious bias training. Most of us have no idea of the biases that we have. For example, you know, ask the woman in the meeting room to get coffee or take minutes. I can't tell you the amount of times that I've been the only woman in the room and have been asked to take the minutes. And uh, they generally don't ask me more than once. <laughs> <laughs> Embrace differences. You know, the best teams have diverse views and opinions. Healthy conflict and debate is a really, really good thing. It helps us to push each other's boundaries and come up with different and often better solutions. Call people out on bias and inappropriate behaviour. So don't tolerate it and always lead by example. And be open-minded. Um, you know, I hadn't worked with any transgender people before and I met um, an amazing woman named V Pendergrast who's the CEO of Surfy Studios in Perth um, maybe nearly 12 months ago now. And I asked her if I could have a bit of a chat with her and get her advice on a few things. You know, I'd had some feedback in one of my previous talks about using the terminology female versus woman. And she gave me all of these amazing tips and insight into, you know, things that make people feel more included and things that I should consider. And as long as you're genuine and authentic about asking questions, there are no stupid questions. People don't mind helping you and giving you some information if they know that you're doing it for the right reasons. Making sure that your environments are really inclusive. So having prayer rooms, being aware of um, different cultural events, providing spaces for breast pumping, breastfeeding, all of these little things help to make an inclusive environment for people. Thankfully, things like paid maternity and paternity leave are starting to become a no-brainer um, and automatic, but also paid superannuation while people are on maternity leave as well. I'm a big fan of Work 180 and the work that they've done in helping in this space, and I know there's a couple of people speaking from Work 180 today. But, you know, not only have they created a job board that specifically targets diversity candidates, but they've also set criteria that, that employers need to meet in order to be able to advertise on the platform, which is incredible. And they've actually driven a whole bunch of customers that have increased their benefits and increased, you know, flexibility and inclusive environments just so that they can advertise on this platform, which is next level. Um, there's also the WGEA, so the Workplace Gender Equality Agency. You know, it's free to fill out an application for this and it's something that you know, it shows that you're working towards the right thing and it shows another accreditation that you can attach to your employer brand. And I think the last point on, the point on this is it needs to be around flexibility for everyone. It's not just about parents or women. We just need to create a culture and environment where flexibility and diversity is just the way that we work. Um, you know, I've met so many men and women that want to work part-time or want flexibility because they have passion projects or they have other things that they want to get involved in. So I think just creating in a culture where flexibility and diversity are just a no-brainer and part of how we work um, can't happen quick enough. I honestly think career development needs to be completely redesigned for jobs of the future, um, but that's a whole talk in itself. In the meantime, in order to be a best place to work, it's really important that you've got clear, transparent and objective processes so that people can have ownership over their own career paths and that people know, you know how, what equals success, how they can measure themselves, but also if they're wanting to be promoted, how they can get to that next level and what that looks like, and it needs to be completely transparent. Um, I'm a big fan of the SOFIA framework, S-F-I-A. Uh, it's a really great framework that, you know, has eight levels and you can kind of map towards those levels and it's completely transparent. Salary conversation as well, making them easier to have and more structured. In a previous company, we didn't have an annual salary review. So we did one behind the scenes where we looked at people's salaries and 
we kind of went, okay, who's out of band and who needs a bump? And we did it behind the scenes. But what that meant is that unless you were one of those people, there was no opportunity for you to have a conversation unless you came and approached the leadership team. Now, you know, there's lots of stats on women not wanting to ask for reviews. But in my experience, working with a lot of introverted people, it's the same thing. They don't want to go and ask for salary reviews either. So they're more inclined just to take another job when it comes up rather than have that conversation. So we need to make it easy for those conversations to happen. Not only do we need to have scheduled times for it to happen, but we also should provide information around salary banding and market information to help, 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 blah, 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 to help people have those conversations and just make it a lot easier. Um, and it's not, also, it's not always about promotions. It's about growing and developing and learning. So, you know, have a look at the performance review process that you've got in your organisations. You know, is it one of these annual meaningless performance reviews where the managers don't want to do it, people don't feel like they're getting anything out of it? What's the point? Why are we doing that then? Um, you need to look at that and, and modernise it. At Redify, we do retros. So we use the same process that we use for our Agile projects and we do a retro based on, you know, what our current role is, how we're tracking in that, areas for improvement. You know, if we're looking at a promotion, we then do a retro on that role as well and look at what our gaps are. And then we can make a plan to, to learn and develop and improve. And it's fantastic. And once again, feel free to have a chat with any of the Redify people or myself about that if it's something you're interested in. Because it's not hard to implement. It's absolutely human nature to want connection. In consulting, this can be a really big challenge, right? Because you've got people out on gigs for maybe three months, six months at a time and spread all over the place. So it's really, really important to create a structure for connection points. At Redify, we have an eight-week onboarding program um, called Ready Robot, which is super cute. Um, we also have people are assigned a buddy, people have a people partner, they have a line manager, and they have principal consultants. So all of these people make time to proactively connect with people. And it's not about people needing help, it's about them feeling valued and it's about building a community and keeping a community together. Communication methods and avenues. Where do people go to connect? It's something that, uh, that I struggle with sometimes. There's so many different avenues now and we know working in tech, you know, I think it's even worse than most organisations. So, you know, is it email, is it Yammer, is it Slack, is it Teams? There's so many different channels. We need to make it clear for people where they go to connect and to collaborate for what things. Creating opportunities for group collaboration and connection as well is really important. Um, and creating these opportunities at different times and different methods to support diversity and inclusion for different people. You know, if you know that you've got people that work part-time on Fridays, well, don't schedule all of your events for Fridays. If you know that you've got people who don't drink, well, don't make all of your events about drinking. You need to consider inclusivity when you're framing up all of these types of events. Group time for innovation, so things like hack days, workshops, Connect people wanting to do the same type of training or professional development. You know, how often is it that you find out, you know, way down the track, oh, they were doing that too, cool. I've just been doing that for the last three months. So how do you connect people that want to learn so that they can do that type of stuff together? Because it's way more fun when you're doing things together, right? Team building events, so social club events, things like time zone, bowling. Um, at Redify, we have a company back to base once a quarter. So the whole state comes together once a quarter. We do workshops. We have a bit of fun. Once a year, we all fly to a fancy resort. Um, and it doesn't need to be, you know, excessive like that. It can, there's lots of cost-effective methods that you can do as well. Um, so things like, you know, morning teas, fundraisers, fitness activities, cycle clubs, end-of-month drinks, um, quiz nights. There's all sorts of things you can do. The other thing I'm really passionate about, which a lot of companies don't do, and it surprises me, is engage people's families. You know, people's families are there to support them when they're stressed, when they're working long hours. Who do you think they're talking to when they're thinking about whether they're taking another job or not? Engage people's families, not just selfishly because you want to retain them, although, you know, a little bit selfishly, but because you're wanting to build a community. In tech, there's so many people that come from all parts of the world and a lot of them don't have a community when they when they come and they start working with you so by connecting with family events 
you know, partners can meet each other, kids can meet each other. In my previous company, you know, one of the things I was really proud of was that it had a real family culture about it and that all of the, all the families and partners knew each other and they'd post on Yammer, we're going camping next weekend, does anyone want to come? And it was a really amazing environment and that's what helps make a great place to work. And then the last point on this one is creating a culture of gratitude and shouting out great work. You know, there's a lot of research around gratitude, culture of gratitude really helping with mental wellness. And mental wellness is such an important piece um, at the moment. And, you know, I don't know anybody who either hasn't, you know, been through depression or doesn't know someone that's going through depression. And then you talk about anxiety and stress, and that's a whole nother level. Every, everyone that I know has experienced some level of anxiety and stress. So anything that we can do as a company to help create a culture that, you know, helps this is really important. Um, verbal thanks is great. You know, there's a lot of companies that do a quarterly awards program, but you want it to be more regular than that. At Redify, we have a shout out wall. So this is something that we've implemented to really help drive that culture of thanks. And people can, you know, just post on there and say, you know, thanks for helping me out in that project. They can post to a team and say, you know, that was amazing, you guys smashed that. Um, so it's just about that common and, and often thanking each other and creating that culture of gratitude. People can comment on it and like it, so it engages the community. And then you can also tie it into your awards program. So we have an awards program called Discover Must Influence. And basically, you know, they can tick a little box up here, is this a DMI nomination? And then once a month, the people team will collect all those nominations and then we'll select some awards to give out. Um, and then you get a, you know, voucher or something, something monetary as well. So you've got the flexibility of how you implement that. Um, and certainly if you're a manager or in HR and you're going for a Best Place to Work award, having something like this, you know, is a huge, um, it goes a long way towards it. So it's a, it's a great return on investment. What can go wrong? <laughs> Sounds easy, right? Um, so many things and so many things that I'm not going to cover. But managers versus leaders are all, is always one of the biggest ones for me. Um, you manage things, not people. So we talked, to, we talked earlier about the key leadership traits. Um, if you've got managers um, that don't have these traits and they don't want to learn them, then you need to move them into a role that's suited to them or you need to performance manage them out and hire good leaders. It's just really difficult to succeed without having good leaders. Operational versus strategic, you know, in this, in this current market, unless you're continuously improving, you are going backwards. So making sure that you've got to focus on strategy and it's not just fighting fires, fighting fires is, is really important. And creating that time for innovation um, may need to be separate to the rest of your BAU work for your organisation. I heard um, the futurist Chris Riddell speaking a few months back at a breakfast and you know, he was saying, you need to have, you need to have part of your business in a shed, you know, like the Microsoft days. You've got to have part of your business that's, you know, innovating, that's not afraid to fail, that's not afraid to experiment, and you've got to have them working on stuff. And if you're a big organisation, you might have to have that to the side. If you're a smaller organisation, you can hopefully spread that culture across your entire organisation, which is what we try to do at Redify. But having a culture where it is safe to fail and experiment and you're celebrating learning and improving is really important across the board anyway. So making sure that there's no blame culture. Um, as soon as you've got a blame culture, it basically stops innovation and it basically stops ownership. Nobody wants to take ownership anymore if there's a blame culture. So that's really important to, to be aware of. Underperformers. Over 80% of the performance improvement plans that I've been part of have been successful and the person has stayed with the organisation and, and been happy to stay with the organisation. So, you know, this feeds back a little bit into George Murch's training, but if you have the right intentions and you want to actually help someone and you go to them genuinely and you help them work out what the gaps are and where they're not performing and you help them put in a training plan, then a lot of the time they'll be successful. So, I think 
you know, we need to not look at these things as being a difficult conversation. We need to look at them as being a conversation where we're trying to help someone, because otherwise they're going to leave your organisation and the same thing's probably going to happen to them somewhere else. So we're doing them a disservice by not being honest with them and helping them through whatever it is. Toxic people, on the other hand, are a very different story. With toxic people, you need to be really clear and tough with them and don't stand for unacceptable behaviour. And this is why shared values and beliefs are so important, because you need to have clear examples and specific things that you can call out when people are displaying behaviour that's not appropriate. And if you don't have these shared values and beliefs to fall back on, it makes performance managing very, very difficult. So calling them out on any specific behaviour that is not aligned to your values is really important and quickly because toxic behaviours like bad bacteria or like any bacteria, it spreads from the inside out and it will affect your good people and you will lose your good people if you don't deal with it quickly. And the last point on this is energy vampires. I only heard a YouTube clip on this like a few days ago and I was like, that's gold, I'm totally adding that in. But we only have a certain amount of energy to give, right? Like it's limited. And every, like, I'm sure you all know that it's quite common 10% of your customers and your people take up 90% of your time and your energy. So we need to be really conscious about that and about how we're spending our energy and that we're saving energy for things that are important. And if those 10% of people are taking up that much energy, we need to look at that and go, okay, well, can I divvy some of that off to other people to use their energy for? Or should we be transitioning those people out so that I don't have, that no one has to invest energy on it? Sometimes you can't do that. Um, but you need to be very conscious about this is what energy I've got and I'm going to use it carefully. So I've, I've left, I don't know how much Q&A time. What, how are we going? Oh, nice. So yeah, I was thinking maybe 10 minutes of Q&A and then I'll do a wrap up. So has anyone got any specific questions around either the award or general kind of best place to work or any tricky questions for me? Oh, Rob. Thanks, Rob. Do you think chasing like the best place to work award is a good like thing to do or is that bad from like an intent point of view? Like is, is it, oh, I just want to get the award or is it I actually want to build a better place for people to be? You know? Yeah. No, great question. Um, I've been told to repeat the questions. Did everyone hear it or do you want me to repeat it? Do we think that it's, um, you know, not genuine intentions if you're just trying to chase an award? Kind of? Yeah. So, um, so yes and no. As a previous HR manager, for me, I really wanted to create a great culture. But I had a CEO at one point who was really only interested in the bottom line. So for me, I was able to say, well, if we create this best place to work culture and we win this award, these are all the things that we're going to be able to, that will come on your bottom line that will help you if you let me do what I want to do. So it gives you leverage as a HR manager or a manager to kind of talk to your execs about tick boxes. For example, the recognition wall, you know, the one that I implemented at that company in particular it was about 40k a year, so it wasn't cheap. Um, it was quite expensive. So my boss basically said to me, well, if you can, if you can guarantee me it's going to get me a Best Place to Work award, you can have the money for it. So I think sometimes it's a means to an end, but obviously, you know, yeah, you, you need to be genuine about why you're doing it. I was. My boss certainly wasn't, but it didn't matter to the employees. The employees were still super happy because, you know, he was, like, far away. <laughs> I don't know if that answered the question. Hi, Jeff. Hey, Donna. Um, is there a shelf life on how long you should display that award? Sometimes you see people display in 2013 and it's now 2018. Yeah, Ratify has... The, I was looking at my LinkedIn last night because I was like, I better change that I live in Melbourne now, not Perth. And um, the thing, it had 2015. And I was like, yeah, I think that's a little old now. Um, probably three years. I don't know. I don't know. I think that's subjective, I guess. Maybe if you're targeting international candidates, it's still kind of a nice thing so that they know at some point you were. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe it could end up showing the opposite. I don't know. Hi, it's down the back.
Yeah, yeah, good question. And sorry, I realised I didn't repeat Jeff's question, which was, was there a shelf life on the BRW award and whether you should display it still on your profile? Um, sorry, what was your name? Uh, Daniel. Daniel. Daniel asked around the retro process, so what's the role of line managers versus peers versus the employee? So that's a good question, and it obviously would be different for different organisations depending on, on how you want to run it and, you know, if there's certain policies and things that you need to meet. Um, at, at Redify, it's very much employee-driven, so our people partners kind of send out little reminders and, and poke people to, you know, do, do one, say, quarterly, but it's very much employee-driven. The employees want to do them because they are always... Look, the culture we have is how do I keep learning, how do I keep improving? So basically the employee will reach out to a ret someone for a retro partner, so that might be someone that they've worked with on a project, so they don't need to be... It's not a hierarchical thing. It can be anybody that they want to do the retro with. Um, it's basically someone to be that partner and do it with them. Um, we have a new system now that's recently been created called Ready Me, where they can upload all the notes and they can also ask for retro contributors. So they can reach out to other peers um, or, you know, principals or line managers or whoever they want and ask them to be a contributor and feed back into that retro, which they'll then take when they do their retro with their retro partner and talk about. Um, so it's very employee driven. Um, line managers have visibility of it, um, but generally, from a line, I guess I would be the line manager as the state delivery manager. Um, I would only kind of really pay attention or get involved if it was a promotion retro. So if they were going through the promotion process, then I'd probably, they'd send me through the link with all the information and I have a read through. And then if I had any questions, I'd follow up with the person directly. Um, but other than that, the line manager, you know, it should be about improvement and self-driven self and self-learning. Hey. Um, you were talking about transparency and, and giving everyone in the community um, the same idea of, of what the plans are for the organisation. Um, and you asked something very much around people, people now have struggling to get everyone on board with that. Um, mm. Yeah, so how do you create transparency across the organisation yeah, was the question. Like yeah, I think um, making them visible is always like the first step. So making sure that you've got a platform like Yammer or Teams or whatever it is so that, you know, your strategy, your vision, your goals are actually in writing, making them visible so that everyone can see them. And then having a regular um, cadence around uh, reviewing them and updating progress against them. So at Redify we do a monthly leadership update meeting, so all of the, the staff from the state um, come and the leadership group, um, which is another kind of cool thing, we have a leadership group as opposed to a state manager, um, so there's a whole, a whole bunch of us across sales delivery and consulting that are involved in that leadership group, but we'll do an update once a month and we'll tell everyone, you know, this is what we've been working on, this is what exec are doing, this is what's going on, and having that structured cadence every month where we can report back helps people keep aware of stuff. So that's a, a physical monthly meeting? People dial in on Teams. Um, so we might have 20% of people in the room and we, you know, put lunch on or whatever, do it as a lunch meeting, and then everyone else will dial into Teams. But there, I've got lots of ideas on that one, so feel free to come grab me afterwards because that's, it's so important. It's so, so important. Did you have a question? Yes, and the question was, uh, how do you scale it? And scaling, as anybody knows that works with Agile, scaling becomes more and more challenging the bigger that you get. Um, and you need to break it down into groups. You, you, you can't, it's very difficult. I won't say you can't, because everything's possible. But it's very hard to do it as one big group. You've got to break it down into different departments and different areas. You know, ThoughtWorks, for example, have a maximum, was that 10 or 5? Just keep going. Um, ThoughtWorks have a maximum of 200 people in any office that they create because of that exact problem with scaling. Scaling becomes really hard. So I would say you can departmentalise it potentially if it's a broader organisation and it's not you know, necessarily IT related. But you've got to have um, great leaders that are ensuring communication and that they, they own a group of people or a, an area and they're doing all of the, all the things they need to do with that particular department but scaling is hard. I like small companies. 
Anyone else? That's room for activities. Yeah. yeah um, Sorry, Will, you're next. Um, well, uh, the question was how what the interview process looks like and how interview interview process helps with scaling. Recruitment is, in my books, one of the absolute most important things to get right because if you get the right people to start with, everything else becomes so much easier. Um, so once again, in tomorrow's talk, I'm going into really like heaps and heaps of detail about recruitment process, interview process. Um, but it is really important for scaling because you've got to get the right people first. Um, it doesn't need to change, so your interview process doesn't, it could be the same whether you're 10 people or whether you're 10,000 people. So that process itself has no, makes no difference, um, but it helps you to scale. Will? Uh, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm angry, every time I have a Zoom meeting, I tend to really get in a lens of frustration. Um, a lot of uh, companies nowadays are kind of distributed where people don't get to see each other very often. How do you affect culture in a positive way when you can't necessarily speak to them directly, but it must be done through the phone? How yeah. How do you convey that you're doing that uh, with earnesty and sincerity? Yeah, tone and context when sending email communication or non-verbal communication is really challenging. Um, and that's why I'm a big fan of trying to create connection points if that's the case. So a connection point could be a Teams meeting or a video, you know, I don't, Skype, is, Skype isn't a thing anymore, but a video, <laughs> a video meeting where you can see people and you can talk. So I would be saying you still need to create some structured connection points. If it can't be face to face, then do it over video. Um, where possible, you know, use the phone as well. I know it's a little bit old school, but it's still, you can share a lot more um, tone and meaning over the phone than you can in an email. Um, yeah, the less email, the better. Um, even more um, things like Teams and using chat as opposed to email. Sometimes email, because it is quite kind of structured, can come across a little bit more abrupt and harsh, whereas even chat is better. Um, so I'd be leaning towards, you know, we use Teams chat all the time. We try not to use email at all at Redify. We need to teach the Victoria team that, but in Perth we don't. <laughs> in Perth we don't. My, no joke, I'm getting like 700 emails a day. I can't even um, one week down. Anyway, yeah. Any other questions? Last chance. Cool. Um, so just to wrap up, I guess my hope today was to inspire you to continue improving and implementing more things to make your workplaces a best place to place a best place to work. Um, because my dream is that everybody uh, gets to love what they do the same way that I do. So thank you very much for coming and for listening.